Hi, my name is Julia Silgi, and I'm a data scientist and software engineer at our studio. And today in this screencast, we're going to use this week's Tidy Tuesday data set on New York Times bestsellers. And we are going to predict whether a book is on the bestseller list for a long time or a short time based on um, the author. We're going to use the author. We're going to do um, a little bit of a different kind of tokenization to get to subword information um, on the on the um, author, the author name, and um, then we'll show bri real briefly how you can get started deploying such a model. All right, let us learn something about um, the bestsellers, the books on the New York Times bestsellers list. So um, let's read in the data here and um, take a look at this. So this is a pretty, this is pretty, you know, that's a lot of books. Um, so this is a great data set for us to look at a little bit. It has, you know, the title, the author, what year, the number of weeks, um, debut rank, best rank, all that. Let's look at um, let's look at this total weeks um, variable and see how it is distributed. So let's see. We'll do um, NY New York Times titles, and let's just make a plain old histogram of it. Um, let's make it small like that. All right. Okay, so we can see um, this is this is the, so this distribution. Uh, most books are just on for one week, and then there's a super super duper long tail here. Let's just see what the um, uh, what the distribution is here. So the median is four, four weeks, and but the max is, you know, <laughs> very long, more than half a year, which is good for them, good job for them. And books, if you go through and look at this, you'll see that books are on here, can come off and back on, and that is um, counted, let's us count it as two rows here. Um, of, of course, um, authors are in here more than once. So let's just look at, um, uh, so let's group by author and then let's do a few things. Um, let's say how many times was each author on the New York Times bestseller list and then um, let's find the median number of weeks like that. Maybe this would look better if I formulated it like, whoops. Okay, maybe that looks better. And let's arrange by descending N. So how many people who are on the New York Times bestseller the most times? All right, so, <clears throat> wow, 116 times Danielle Steele, the winner, the winner there. And so the median number of times her books were on the New York Times list was five and a half, but she has been on the New York Times bestseller list <laughs> Um, 116 times. And then we see, um, you know, Stephen King, Dean Koontz, Mary, Mary Higgins Clark, like these are, Nora Roberts, you know, these are the, these are the giants of the popular publishing world. So this gives us a good idea of like kind of the kind of data that we're looking at. And so what I want to do in this um, screencast is to show like, can we, can we connect this total weeks like what we have here and maybe say let's let's say um below and above this this median number here and let's say like what authors are um uh, can we you know let's use the data to learn what about like what author names are um are more likely to be on for a long time and um more likely to be on uh, for less time so let's let's get started with this let's so i'm going to load tidy models so we're connecting name um author name to whether it was on the bestseller list for a longer or a shorter time so let's take the um the titles um and let's I'm going to use transmute um, and let's take the author, of course, so we get the author and then let's take the um, that total weeks and we're going to make it like total weeks greater than four. So is it above the um, 
above the median or below. So this is true, false, true, false. Let's make that into a, um, not a logical, but a, you know, a character factory type of thing. And so if it is bigger, let's call that a long time. And if it is not bigger than four, let's call it a short time there. Um, let's get rid of anything that has an NA in the author or the total weeks. And then let's, um, let's uh, pipe that to initial split. And so that, this is going to be our data that we use. Um, we're dividing it into testing data and training data. And let's do stratified resampling. So we have a balance there of um, long and books that were on the list for a long and a short time. So let's call it books split like this. And then ooh, let's set a seed like so. And then we will get um, books train. So we will get the training data. We will get the testing data. And then let's also make some resampling folds. So this part of our analysis is like, um, let's call it book folds, is uh, spending our data budget. So we are putting some data into training, some into testing, holding, holding it out to the very end. And then we are going to um, make some resampling folds that we can use for evaluating our data like this evaluating our model, excuse me. So we have 10 cross-validation folds, and in, these folds are all made with the training data. And what they do is, um, as we go through and evaluate our model, we'll train on this data, evaluate on this, train on this, evaluate on this, and we can do that um, 10 times. All right, so let us um, set up a model. So for this model, um, I think I'm going to use, I'm going to use a linear um, support vector machine like this. Um, so it, I can just say mode equals classification like so. And it, uh, we're going to use the default engine there. So let's call it SESVM -E spec. So I'm going to use a linear support vector machine. It's pretty fast and works pretty good with, you know, this kind of text data, text-ish. But this is just sort of text data, right? Um, I'm gonna. So let's let's how we're gonna do this. So we are going to um, use. Let's use the text recipes package, which contains add-on um, pre-processing and feature engineering steps for text. And so I start by setting up my recipe. So I'm gonna say I'm gonna pass in a formula total weeks. Um, explained by author like this and the data that I'm using to learn my um, <clears throat> learn my pre-processing transformations is my training data and then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go through um, did I load this I'm gonna go through and first I'm gonna tokenize the data so I would say tokenize author like there. Then I will say I want, I don't want to keep every single token, like every single name that's in here. Uh, I'm just, this is a, you know, they're just names, name tokens. So I'm going to just keep the top 100. And then I will uh, use, I will weight this by term frequency. This is just counts. And then since I'm using that support vector machine, um, I am going to normalize it. Although it's pretty normalized already. I'll, they'll all be numeric, but at this point, um, like that. So let's call this my books recipe. Um, and so let me just show you what this looks like. So I'm going to prep it. I am going to bake to get the data out. Just the training data. That's what new data equals null means is just get me the training data back out. And then I'm going to do skimmer skim so I can just like look at it. Um, so when you use, when you go through and use feature engineering in your modeling, I, you know, I prefer to put it book workflow in a workflow like this where I'll say, hey, put my recipe, put my model, um, like so. Um, 
uh, I don't really have to prep bake, you know, like know what all these words mean um, to, to put them into my model. However, I'm going to experiment a little bit with this, um, with this uh, tokenization. And so I want to be able to um, see what it looks like, see what it literally like looks like. So here I'm just tokenizing by with spaces into words and I get, um, and taking the topmost 100, um, common ones. We've got our friend Danielle Steele, who we know will be in there because, um, you know, she had, oh, she had over a hundred, um, she herself had over a hundred, um, appearances, but um, I want to do a different, I want to take a different option for tokenization. I am going to tokenize using um, the word piece algorithm. So um, tokenizing the way that I just showed it just divides by spaces into the words, which in this case are names. Um, but word piece tokenization is different. It works a little bit like byte pair encoding, if you've ever um, talked about that. But what it does is, um, is it creates, it like looks for all the characters first and then um, the word piece algorithm learns it like progressively learns rules about merging them together the to the characters together to form tokens and it's not just the most common tokens it doesn't just find like the sub words that are the most common um, oh it, to be clear if I didn't say this already it's for finding sub words not necessarily for for just finding complete words um, instead it uses maximum likelihood to say um, uh, to choose which of the um, tokens to keep and tokens in this case are sub words um, and then once it has those rules you know it stores them and we can apply them on new data so let's, um, let me look at the, let me look at this, run it. All right, so now instead of just names, we have things that can be parts of names. So we have, uh, so these with the, with the hashtag thing, the pound sign, these are all subwords here. Um, man, like um, O-N-T, Ovich, you know, like, so these are subwords that it has decided via maximum likelihood it should keep. Um, so, uh, it's a great way to deal with in a text when you want to be able to find subword information and use that as your features. Um, I think this looks fine. I think, let me look at step tokenize word piece. Let's look at this. Um, I am just gonna drop this down. Um, so these are names, and so none of them are that long. So I'm just going to drop this down to like 10 here. Okay, there we go. So this this will probably look about the same because I bet it wasn't even trying to get something that was, you know, more than 10 together. But this looks about the same. You know, so these are subwords, and then these are whole words. Cla or No, these must be subwords too. Um, Evan. Lisa, here we go. Okay, all right, so these are our features that we're going to use. So by putting these things together, so we have chosen a model, a model which um, tends to work pretty well for this kind of, this kind of texty um, uh, data that we have, and then we have pre-processed these author names into subwords, and then we put them together in a workflow. So pre-processing, feature engineering, modeling together in a workflow. Um, now, let's see how this model is going to do. So I am going to um, use parallel processing on my computer because I have 10 um, resampling folds and they're independent of each other, so I want to do that. Um, one thing to know about this model, if, you, if we go here, it is going to tell us that um, the SVM, if we go through here and click through and find, whoops, read about it here, um, it will tell us something about this um, model, including that it does not produce class probabilities. So let's set up a set of metrics, let's call it books metrics like this, and we're only going to use metrics that um, use the hard, the hard um, class predictions, not the probabilities, so that we can use accuracy for that, we can use sensitivity for that, we can use specificity for that, like so. And then let's use fit resamples. 
because none of this needs to be tuned or anything like that. So I'm just going to fit it 10 times to get a good estimate of how it's performing. So we're going to, we're going to um, resample our workflow. Um, I am going to use those cross validation folds that I made earlier. And then I am going to um, use these metrics here. So that's, that's everything like that. And when it runs, let's just look at the metrics book RS like that. Okay. So let's, did I get everything? I think so. Okay. Um, so these particular models don't have any, you know, um, tuning parameters. Um, I could, I could tune like this. I think I could tune this, but we're just going to kind of go for it. Um, and the model itself also does not, this does not have any tuning parameters either. So we just fit it. So what I've done here is I fit it 10 times to each of my cross validation folds and then evaluate it on the, the held out data there. And then we get a, a measure of accuracy, sensitivity, and specificity. Okay, so this is, um, you know, this is not <laughs> fantastic results, but surely if I told you the name of a author of a book, you would not expect me to, you know, you would not be expect to very accurately say whether it will be on the New York Times bestseller list for um, more than four weeks or not. Like, you, you wouldn't be, you, we're probably not surprised at this result, right? But that's, that's, so that's good. Nothing shocking or we haven't had some kind of data leakage, right? Um, okay, so uh, that was fitting to the resamples to get a, um, an estimate of performance. Now let's go to the, um, the testing data. Uh, let's say, yep, yeah, I'm using this model. I'm, I'm pushing forward. So I'm going to use the last fit function, which um, I can use this workflow here. Um, instead of resamples, I'm going to, um, I'm going to pass in the training testing split and what this, and I also need to say the metrics because, uh, same thing is happening here. Okay. So let's, and let's do the same. Let's look at the metrics, um, for the final result here. So what we're doing here is we're now fitting to the whole training set one time instead of 10 times the little resamples of the training set, the whole training set one time, and then we're evaluating on the testing data. So these have 10 here, because these this is the value, um, the mean of it being done 10 times, but now this is only one time on the testing data. So I am now evaluating just on the testing data. It's about the same, um, so no surprises there, which is good. And we have our, um, we have our results. So now we have a fitted model. Um, what do I do with it now? So I can also look at the predictions from the, and this is predictions from the training data. Notice not from, oh, I said that wrong. It's the predictions from the testing data, not the training data. And I can com compute a confusion matrix. So first I pass in the true, um, uh, the true category and then the um, predicted category like this. And this gives us a little printout or we can make a visualization like so. So let's take a look at this and see what it is that we're, what, what do those values of sensitivity and specificity, what do they translate to? So for a, so the truth is here on the x-axis. So for a bestseller that was on the list for a short time, the big box here, that is us evaluating it correctly, predicting correctly. The small rectangle up here is us doing that incorrectly. For books that were on the bestseller list for a long time, unfortunately, the small rectangle is us um, doing predicting correctly, and the bigger one is uh, <clears throat> is us um, being incorrect. So we are better at recognizing the short the books that are on the list for a short time than a long time. Um, however, if you want to look at it this way from the Y, um, if we do predict short, um, I'm sorry, if we do predict long, then um, we can look at this and see how likely we are to be, 
have to have been right. Um, so the this is like the positive predictive value, the negative predictive value, that type of thing. So we can look at this in understanding where is our model doing well or better, and when is it doing worse for which of these categories. All right, so we can understand our model predictions more deeply. We also can get out that um, that that workflow that was predicted, that was um, trained on the training data. Like that's 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 what we want, right? So let's call this final fitted, and I'm gonna say, I'm gonna take I'm gonna extract the workflow from that result, um, like this. And so I could predict. Um, on this model, this this is the thing I can use for prediction. Um, let's let's just take the testing data for now. Um, I'm just gonna take the testing data, just one of them, like this. Um, so I predicted this that that one is short, but you know I don't really know what that is. Let's put augment there. Okay, so that one we got right. That one we got right. That one we got right. All right, so we're we're <laughs> on a on a on a roll being right there, so so we can predict and augment, right? Um, maybe we'd like to understand um, what is driving the predictions, up or down. So let's take um, this final fitted workflow and let's tidy it. So here we get out the terms and the estimates. Um, let's take... Uh, the ones that move it the most, either positive or negative, let's take like 20 or so, like that. Um, so this is the 20 um, subwords identified by the word piece tokenization that move the prediction the most in one way or the other. So look, steel, um, steel moves it so much in the positive direction, right? Because of Danielle Steel. But if your name is Danielle, but you're not Daniel Seal. It <laughs> moves it in the other direction, and we see the, these things here. Um, notice that we did, like, we kept in um, every time Danielle Steel was on this list. We kept all of those. We did not. Um, uh, so Danielle Steel is in this this data set 100 times. So it's. Um, you know, you, we've been thinking about this a lot right now on the Tidy Models team about like case weights. And so this is basically like, um, it's not exactly the same because the it's Danielle Steele with many different, um, many different uh, total weeks here. Um, like she's not, she wasn't always on the the list for a long time versus a short time. Um, however, this is something, you know, that you have to decide, like, is it more appropriate for our modeling question to keep Danielle Steele in every single time or to only have Danielle Steele in the data set one time? Um, but let's, you know, we're just going to, we're, I'm saying I'm interested in, I think those are separate observations, right? Those are not, um, I don't want to do distinct or anything like that. Um, and then let's make a plot so we can put, um, I'm going to say the absolute value of the estimate. Y is going to be term. Fill is going to be whether it is positive or negative, meaning does it make it longer or shorter. Uh, we'll do geom call like that. All right, so let's change a few things about this. So let's um, remove from term, let's tf author underscore like that. And then let's make, let's make it a factor so that term is ordered by estimate. Oh, it's gonna have to be absolute value of estimate like that, okay? Um, okay, yes, good, okay. So now, um, uh, I want to change the, um, true or false there. I'm gonna, so I'm going to put some labels on the fill. So we're going to say, um, so fewer weeks, more weeks, like that. And then we will say... Um, y equals null, and then fill, we can say something like, like how many weeks on the bestseller list, like that. 
Um, let's put a line break there. Okay. Okay, I think this is pretty good. Okay, so so if your name is Steel, um, you're, that pushes you to being on the list more than the median. Danielle, less. Um, and then we have these subwords in here, right? Like Janet um, is not a subword, but F and Bald are, right? And this like this G, this is something that's a subword. So what WordPeats tokenization gives you is this subword tokenization, getting to the subwords of names, like something furred, something furred, you know, something of itch. Um, so um, one of the great things about um, this kind of subword tokenization is it, uh, it can usually see evaluate new tokens that you've never seen, new words that you've never seen before, because it's actually evaluating the subwords uh, that are inside of the token. So that's pretty cool. Okay, so the last thing I want to do is something I have not done in a um, in a video yet, and that's talk about how you can deploy this um, model. So I'm working on a new package called Vetiver. And vetiver is an ingredient in um, perfumery or scented candles, and it's it's also called the oil of tranquility, and it's it's a stabilizing ingredient. So think about vetiver as um, um, <clears throat> something that can stabilize and deploy your model in reliable ways. So what you want to deploy is the thing that you can predict on. So it is this final fitted object here, this fitted workflow that I got out of last fit. And then I need to pass in, um, uh, at the very least, a name for this model. Like what am I going to call this model? Um, and then I will print, do the printout here. And so what I've done here by creating this vetiver model is I've created a deployable model object. It's a model that is ready for deployment. And it, you know, it, it has extracted some stuff like what, what are, what are we doing here? And it's, it captures both the feature engineering and the modeling all in one deployable model object. And here briefly, I'm just going to show how you might do, um, how you might set this up um, as a, um, a plumber REST API. Um, but I have we have some whole new materials that you can go learn more about this. I just kind of want to um, show you how you might get started here. So um, I can, so let me, I'll, I'll run all this. And so what this does is it has set up a um, an API. And if I want to uh, run this interactively, here, I can let me make this a little bigger, like so. Um, oh, I guess that's okay. Anyway, um, so we we see our endpoints here, and so this is a health check endpoint to see that you can use to see if the API is up, and then here is our prediction endpoint. So it's at predict. So this is, um, think about this as like a self-documenting um, visual, you know, documentation for your model API. Um, we know, you know, like we know things about what it's like. We know how many features there are. And you can actually directly interact with your model via this API. Like here, um, let's say, let's see what would happen. Oh, sad, sad. My book would only be on the New York Times bestseller list for a short time. But what about um, if my last name were Steel? <laughs> ah, yes, of course. Um, so this is this is a a long time here. So, um, uh, what if Danielle Steele had my last name? Ah, uh, yep, just just. <laughs> Short, she would not be as successful. Um, uh, so what this gives you is this. So this is um, this is um, visual do documentation for an OP open API specification that you like. I can open this in my browser and actually see the JSON for the open API specification. So what you get here that I'm showing is um, a deployable model object that you can version a, um, a, a REST API that you can use, you know, for like a model microservice um, together with like generated visual documentation that you can use or you can um, show with collaborators. So if you're interested in learning more about Vetiver, um, you know, take a look, go learn about it, and um, I, you can see if it will fit your needs. All right. 
We did it. We trained a model to um, to predict whether a New York Times bestselling book would be on that list for a long time or a short time using word piece tokenization, a kind of tokenization to subwords on the author's names. We saw um, how, you know, like, how impactful some of the like uh, authors are who um, have been on the um, bestseller list a ton, right? Like we saw how much that impact impacted the model that we built. And we um, also uh, used Vetiver to show how we could deploy this model as a REST API. So I'm really excited about Vetiver. And um, if you want to uh, learn more, I encourage you to like look it up. You can go to vetiver.tidymodels.org and see more about how it works and how to store version and deploy your models.